Many years ago, I came up with my own definition of anthropology. It was philosophy with the people in. And by this I meant two things. Firstly, the questions that anthropology asks are indeed philosophical ones. They are questions about what it means to be, to know, to think, imagine, perceive, act, remember, learn, live in the company of others, administer justice, exercise power, relate to the environment, confront our own mortality, and so on and so forth. These questions are endless. But secondly, the way anthropology does its philosoph philosophizing is primarily through its engagements in both observation and conversation with the people among whom we work. Indeed, I would now go further to include not just the people, but all the other things and beings of manifold kinds with whom or which we share our lives. And there is here an implied criticism of philosophical philosophers who would rather shy away from any such engagement, preferring to labor in the library with their canonical texts. We anthropologists, I contend, can do philosophy better by virtue of bringing into the conversation the voices, the experience, and the wisdom of countless human beings, not to mention legions of non-humans, which would otherwise be excluded. And to join this conversation is, in effect, to practice an ecology of life. But this ecology is not just about the world. In an important sense, which I shall elaborate, it is the world. So to join the conversation is to inhabit the world. That the world we inhabit is indeed one world is, in my view, a core principle of our discipline. And it is a principle that we neglect at our peril. I am afraid that in practice it has all too readily been neglected, along with the challenges and responsibilities it entails, in favour of a facile appeal to plurality. It sometimes seems that anthropologists are constitutionally averse to oneness, to singularity, and likewise obsessed with the plural. Never one world, always many worlds. But what do we mean by plurality? And in what sense is it opposed to singularity? The question of how to reconcile the singular and the plural, or in slightly different terms, the universal and the particular, could well turn out to be the central problem of a truly philosophical anthropology. Let me offer an example. People living in the high Arctic, mainly in northernmost Canada and Greenland, know themselves and are known as Inuit. The word is a plural form derived from the singular Inuk, which roughly translates as soul. In a modern idiom, we might suppose that every soul belongs to an individual, and therefore that the plural Inuit simply denotes a population of individuals. Greenland and Canada, we say, have their respective Inuit populations. We could do a census and count them up. But for the people themselves, at least traditionally, souls could not be counted or enumerated in this way. As the ethnographer Henry Stewart has noted, the plural form is most certainly not a collective designation for all original inhabitants of the tundra Arctic. It rather connotes something like autonomous existence. Most often, the plural suffix, that is miut, follows a toponym or place marker, as, for example, netzilic, plural, netzilingmiut, or iglulic, plural, iglulingmiut. And that toponym could be glossed as soul life going on in and around this place. But the question this raises 
is of how to get from one to the other, from the life of the soul, Inuk, to soul life, Inuit. Not by multiplication, or not at least in the arithmetic sense familiar to us from elementary school. Nor, conversely, can you get from soul life to the life of the soul by division. Call the plural a multiplicity if you must, but do not suppose that it is a multiplication of the singular. The soul, after all, is not an entity sunk inexorably into itself. That is to say, it is not an entity. It is more fundamentally a movement which takes the grammatical form not of the noun or pronoun, but of the verb. And the most outstanding characteristic of this movement is that it carries on or keeps on going. For Inuit people, it even carries on over generations. As a grandchild, for example, is animated by the soul of its grandparent, leading parents to address their children sometimes as they would address their own parents and to treat them with equal deference and respect. So the idea of early years, as though children were closer to some imaginary point of origin in a process of socialization, makes no sense. Everyone, at any moment, is both older and younger than themselves. Thus, souls, or lives, are movements, and to echo the celebrated aphorism of Heraclitus, one cannot step twice into the life of the same soul. So what is the relation between the life of the soul and soul life? Or to put it in more general terms, between the particular life and life itself? Is it a relation of part to whole? Now, I have nothing against the idea of life as a whole, so long as we do not think of this whole as a totality. Holism is one thing, totalization is quite another, and it is vital to acknowledge their distinction. Totality, to my ear at least, implies addition and completion. But life itself is never complete, nor, as I have tried to show, can we approach it by any process of summation, whether additive, additive or multiplicative. It is not a completion, but a continual origination. Life, as one elder from among the Weminji Cree of northern Canada told the ethnographer Colin Scott, life is continuous birth. It is the generative potential of a world in becoming, a world that is forever worlding. So, is the particular life a part of life as a whole? Is the life of the soul a part of soul life? And again, I have nothing against the idea of lives as parts. But then we should think of these parts, too, as ways of carrying on like the voices of a composition. And the analogy I have in mind is that of polyphonic music, in which every voice or every instrument carries on along its own melodic line. In music, the relation between parts and whole is not summative, it is neither additive nor multiplicative, but contrapuntal. Think of the tenor part in the chorus or the cello part in the symphony. And I want to think of the life of every particular soul, likewise, as a line of counterpoint that, even as it issues forth, is continually attentive and responsive to each and every other. Souls, as we might say, are answerable to one another, a condition that carries entailments of both responsiveness and responsibility. Precisely because souls go along together and because their continual regeneration is nourished and impelled by the memory of their association, the composition 
formed by their contrapuntal movement, cannot be decomposed without causing grief, if not destruction, to the lives of its parts. And this is why I am disinclined to think of the composition as an assembly or assemblage, as it is ubiquitously rendered through awkward translation from the French, agencement. The source for this translation commonly turns out to lie in the sprawling meditations of philosopher Gilles Deleuze and his collaborator, psychoanalyst Félix Guettari, in A Thousand Plateaus, Mille Plateaux, of which more below. The difficulties of translating this work are indeed formidable. And it is true that some of the plethora of senses that have clustered around assemblage as something like a gathering or bundling of lifelines reminiscent of sheaves of corn at harvest do approximate to what I have in mind. But other senses most definitely do not. An example is philosopher Manuel de Landa's appropriation of the term to denote a transitory and contingent coming together of heterogeneous components that cohere only through an exterior contact or adhesion that leaves their inner natures more or less unaffected and that can therefore be detached and reconfigured in other arrangements without loss. This, to my mind, is precisely how not to describe the way that particular lives play into life itself. And the trouble is that by resorting to the notion of assemblage as a catch-all, it is all too easy to obscure or gloss over a distinction that I consider to be of capital importance. And this is the distinction between the kinds of work done in language with the little words and and with. The logic of the conjunction and is articulatory. That of the preposition with is differential. Contrasting the figures of the tree and the rhizome, Deleuze and Guattari <coughs> allow them to stand respectively for filiation and alliance. And the deleuze guattarian multiplicity is unashamedly rhizomatic rather than dendritic. And the rhizome, they say, is nothing but alliance. Let me quote. The tree imposes the verb to be, but the fabric of the rhizome is the conjunction and, and, and. Now, with respect... This is grossly unfair to living trees, which, unlike their diagrammatic counterparts, grow, branch, and swerve from within the midst of things every bit as much as do the tangling roots of the rhizome. In the sphere of human relations, although filiation might be marked on the anthropologist's genealogical chart as a line connecting two points, standing respectively for parent and child, as there on the left. In real life, it is a process of becoming in the course of which, through growing older together, the child carries on the life of its parent while progressively differentiating its own life from that which engendered it. Filiation is not the connection of parent and child, it is the life of parent with child. And just as in musical counterpoint, parts are not components that are added to one another, but movements that carry on alongside one another, so too in the human family, lives lived in counterpart and counterpoint are not and, 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 but with, with, with. And in answering or responding to one another, they co-respond. And so in place of the assemblage, as a way of talking about the multiplicity of soul life 
as if it were an alliance of souls, I propose the term correspondence to connote their affiliation. Life as a whole, then, is not the articulation, but the correspondence of its particulars. Those two lines there are corresponding. One is parent, the other the child. So it follows that the relations that make up the whole are not between, but along. Betweenness gives us the idea of interaction, a reciprocal back and forth exchange between subject positions. The al alongness of correspondence, by contrast, does not go back and forth, but side by side, like companions walking along together or playing music together. And the thing about walking and playing is that they do not issue from a position, but continually pull the performer out of it. Both, as the philosopher of education, Jan Maschelein, puts it, both are practices of exposure, expositio, out of position. The English language has a beautiful word, longing, to describe the exposure of going along. In longing, an imagination that lies beyond the horizon of conceptualization loops proleptically back to meet an origination that lies beyond the reach of memory. As in the cycling soul life of the Inuit, in a place where past and future merge. It is a place we perpetually dream of and strive for, but never reach. We live on the inside of eternity, as Australian Aboriginal people have long been trying to tell us with their ontology of the dreaming, or every when. So with this in mind, let me return to the problem of universality. What can it mean to say of the one world that it is universal? And how does it relate to the particular or to the relativity of the particular moment, the particular life, the way of the soul? It means, I think, that we have to think of difference in terms of differentiation rather than diversity. And this distinction is critical. And one way to get at it is to reflect upon the meaning of the ground. How often have we heard it said that cultural particulars are superimposed upon the ground of a universal human nature? Well then, what is the ground? Is it, as the founder of ecological psychology, James Gibson once put it, is it an underlying surface of support upon which all else rests? Or is it rather, to follow the thinking of Tadashi Suzuki, one of the foremost figures of contemporary Japanese theater, is the ground a source of growth and nourishment? For Gibson, the ground is but a platform, affording nothing to its inhabitants, save that it is stand honorable. To be habitable, says Gibson, any environment must be furnished with objects, much as an interior room must be furnished if a householder is to do more than stand in it. As chairs, tables and cupboards are set upon the floor of the room, Gibson explains, so hills, trees and boulders are set upon the ground. As such, the ground appears as a plane of indifference a tabula rasa, from which all variations have been excised, only to be imposed as diverse freestanding entities upon it. For Suzuki, quite to the contrary, the ground is the very source of emergent difference. It gives rise to the features we see, to the formations of the landscape, to trees and buildings, even people. The floorboards of the traditional Japanese house, Suzuki tells us, virtually grow into the inhabitants who walk them, just as did the trees from which the boards were made once grow from the earth. So here, the ground 
is no more indifferent to the trees than our floorboards to people. Rather, trees and people arise from the earth and from boards, respectively, in an ongoing process of differentiation. So the distinction I want to emphasize here is between the ground of indifference and the ground of differentiation, or if you will, between the respective grounds of being and becoming. Being different, that is diversity. Becoming different, that is differentiation. And differentiation turns to diversity by way of the twin operations of excision and reimposition, where excision cuts things out from the processes of their generation, reimposition deposits them as ready formed particulars upon the universal ground of indifference. So, there on the right, the person is part of the ground, emerging from it. The person is a fold in the ground, but in the, on the left hand side, the person is cut out and deposited on the hard base of the floor. So this ground that's on the left-hand side there is, as we are inclined to say, hard, providing a solid but inert foundation for the objects that rest upon it and for the activities that are conducted across its surface. And it's worth noting that exactly the same metaphor is imported into our thinking about the human mind when neuropsychologists, for example, speak of the mind's hardware as offering a neural substrate capable of supporting various kinds of cognitive operations, including those of speech and manual tool use. In the very division between the hardware and the software it supports, the separation of knowing from being or of sapiens from homo is replicated and reinforced. So what would happen if, to the contrary, we were to think of the ground of human perception and cognition, or of sentience and sensibility, as something more like the floorboards of the traditional Japanese house, or, with Deleuze and Guattari, like a field of long grass, or even like the earth itself? Because to think of difference in terms of differentiation rather than diversity is to imagine the universal not as a featureless ground upon which all variation is deposited, but as a surface that is as folded and crumpled as the earth beneath our feet. With the logic of diversity, of excision and reimposition, all difference is bilateral. So as features are distinguished from the ground by way of their excision, so the ground is distinguished from their features that are then reimposed upon it. But as Deleuze sets out to show in his book on difference and repetition, in becoming different, one thing can distinguish itself from another without the latter's distinguishing itself from the former. Imagine. Imagine lifting a sheet to form a crease. We register the line of the crease. We see it as something that has an existence of its own. Here we have a dirty handkerchief. I lift it up. And there, there, is, there is the crease. It has an existence of its own. And yet the crease is still in the sheet. It is not as though the sheet had parted company with the crease and sunk back into flat homogeneity, leaving the crease line, as it were, high and dry. So it is too with lines and the ground. The line, says Deleuze, distinguishes itself from the ground without the ground distinguishing itself from the line. The distinction, in short, is unilateral. And so every distinguishing feature is a fold in the ground. So my contention is that in a life of longing, all difference arises thus, from within, in the midst of things. And it is, in that sense, interstitial. And it follows that the life of the soul is to soul life, as is the crease to the sheet, 
or as is the line to the ground. As the crease distinguishes itself from the sheet or the line from the ground, so the particularity of the singular life distinguishes itself from the universality of life itself without the universals distinguishing itself from the particular. And that's why I call the process one of interstitial differentiation rather than exterior articulation. As articulation is to differentiation, so is alliance to filiation, so is assemblage to correspondence. Perhaps you might compare the distinction to that between cutting timber transversally with a saw and splitting it longitudinally, longitudinally with an axe. The saw, as in the top diagram there, the saw cuts the length of timber into blocks or sections which can only be reassembled through conjunction. But the axe, in the lower diagram, the axe joins with the timber as in its swerve it corresponds with lines of growth that were incorporated into the wood when it was part of a living tree. The axe Act, the axe acts on the timber as the preposition to the noun, following the grain of the world's becoming and differentiating it from within. 